um, well, it looks like we're in a new place, just not where we thought, right? <laughs> um, so, here's my message. It's an outline now. Who knows how long I'm going to talk. So. It's safer when I have a transcript, because then it's limited. You know? um, oh, oh, oh. Okay, can you guys all hear me? In the back? Yeah. All right, so pretty much um, today I want to answer a few questions for you, and there will be a time for um, discussion. If you have questions that I don't answer in my opening remarks, you could say. Um, so the question is, how did how, how did we get here? How did this happen? And um, well. One reason is by the grace of God, but the reason why God's grace and intervention was necessary was because of my pride and because of some very poor leadership on my part. Um, back in May, when I really do believe that God did speak to me, I do believe that He set me down, set me on a path, because everything does come from God. He knows exactly what's going on. He knows exactly how we respond to things, good or bad. But, so I do believe he did set me down the path of the Barry Robinson Theater. He showed it to me. He knew that I would like it. He knew all the little circumstances that week would set me on a path of thinking that this is exactly where we're supposed to go. And it turns out I'm really good at hearing God say go, but I'm not very good at hearing him say stop. Because he said stop pretty quick. And I ignored it. It happened when the first time that I brought Rachel and Matt over there. They were, you know, Rachel was uncertain. It really wasn't for it. Matt was uncertain. And instead of listening and saying, well, let's pray about this and gather the advisory team, I just got annoyed. Because I thought I'd heard from God. And why are you guys disagreeing with me? Now, I will say that at the time, I didn't realize this is what I was doing. God has been good and gracious and shown me these things this past week. Um, but it doesn't excuse what I've done. Because the next thing I did was one of the next few people that knew about it weren't excited about it. I still pushed forward. And then when I had the leadership bubble and I brought many of you guys over there to see it, there was mixed reviews. Some were excited about it, but the children's ministry especially was like, how in the world do you expect us to do church in a cafeteria? And I said, figure it out. And listen. Instead of waiting and pausing, I just went ahead and presented the whole thing to the church the next day on Sunday. And again, there was pushback, and instead of listening, I still pushed forward. In fact, I even had one good friend give me a text and say, Hey, there's a lot of people that don't agree with this. Be careful chasing this shiny object. You might lose it all. And instead of listening, I got offended. And so I kept pushing forward. And, then, and many of you raised concern with Jen. You were one of them. I didn't listen to you. I didn't even consult the advisory team. Barb, Sandy, uh, Rich Roger, Rich isn't here. Um, Paul, I don't know where he's at. But basically, the what I do with the advisory team is I call a quick, like last second meeting and after church on a Sunday and gave them the highlight version, and that was about it. Um, and so, despite all of the disunity and despite all of the uh, you know, push back. Uh, I push forward, and then to make things. Easy. And then not only did God use you guys to try to stop me, He even used a dream. Those of you that guys know the story of how I left reality before and came here, God spoke to me through someone else's dream very clearly before, and He tried to do it again. But instead of listening, even though my wife knew exactly what the dream meant. You know, I, have it, I have this all in my journal. This is why I know exactly what I did. I just said, well, I don't know what that means, and I moved forward. And, um, and then to top it all off, I just handed it all over to Matt to run the thing while I went on vacation. That's how all of that went down, is that my pride blinded me uh, to really listening to all of you and taking heed to what you had to say. In fact, I, I, it's right there in my journals. There were times when I said, God, are you telling me to stop? Man, I feel like, you know, have you ever seen that Bruce Almighty movie? 
when he's like, God, give me a sign, you know, and there's the truck full of signs, stop, 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 caution, caution, ah, get out of my way. Um, and, but God is good. And um, before I move on, I have to ask for your forgiveness because I failed you as a leader, uh, as, a, as your pastor, as, as your friend, and I am sorry for what I have done. So I do ask for your forgiveness uh, because I know that I have God's, because he showed me that this past week. So now that I've told you how we got here, let me tell you how it is God saved us. <laughs> So I went on vacation, and I really did a good job of staying out of the loop. I didn't check my email. I wasn't on Facebook at all. But unlike some of you that have been on Facebook and say you miss it, I didn't miss it. I was, like, ready to get back on it. But um, I'm starting to not like anyway. Um, <laughs> too much political commentary. Um, so Monday morning, I have a staff meeting. And the first person I meet with is Sandy. We meet at 8 o'clock. And then I meet with the rest of the staff at 9. And so I got there a few minutes before Sandy did, and then when he walked in, he sat down. The first thing he says, I have something very serious to talk to you about. And he pretty much proceeded to tell me that he had a very strong and growing Holy Spirit conviction that we should not go to this theater. Now, granted, we were supposed to move in today. <laughs> this was on Monday. And so I started down the path of getting upset and getting angry about it, but then I said, let me go get some more coffee. <laughs> and as I was walking, I got coffee. It's just almost like scales coming off my eyes. And God started showing me all the reasons why Sandy's right, despite this, the one reason in particular that he had in mind, which was the Catholic connection. There's many reasons. It's too expensive. No one was on board. I mean, you, you name it. There's a long list of reasons not to do this. But I trust son Sandy. He's a man of God, and he's a, a mentor and a very good friend to me. And uh, I'm thankful that God softened my heart just enough in that moment to actually listen. And so, all right, well, we'll I'll talk to we'll talk to the staff about it when they get here. And so then, when the staff got there, um, I was like, Hey, here's a serious question. What would you guys think of pulling out of this move and doing church at the office this Sunday? And every single one of them, without hesitation, said, yeah, sure, yeah, sure, yeah, sure. So I was like, well, that was easy, <laughs> you know. Um, so then I asked the reasons, and it was all the same reasons that I already knew about. And um, so I, I was in a bit of a, a weird place on Monday. Um, I would say that I went through the five stages of grief in about 24 hours, you know. And so then on Tuesday, I met with um, the advisory team one at a time, and I kind of explained to them what had happened. But I didn't tell them the leadership part because it had not yet been revealed to me. You see, God has a way, when he likes to talk to me, sometimes he likes to keep me up all night. And so he kept me up all night on Tuesday night and revealed to me those things I just told you about leadership, about my shiny object and about my pride. And, um, and so then I spent the rest of... Wednesday and Thursday apologizing to people and, um, and so today's kind of the, the cap on all that and one of the things that God really showed me um, not Tuesday night but on Thursday morning when he woke me up at about 3.30 was just how close I came to losing something very precious to me you know, leadership is not something that should be taken for granted, and I think maybe I did. And um, it was pride. You know, pride will blind you, and it sneaks up on you, and you don't see it. And, but God is gracious, and he is good. It says in Psalm 32, Blessed is he whose transgressions are forgiven, and whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man whose sin the Lord does not count against him and in whose spirit is no deceit. Those words have new meaning for me. Because of how it's, it's, it's such a blessing to see what the consequences would have been 
Because I know for certain I would have lost at least half of my staff and eventually all of, it, it would have all crashed and burned. And I would have hurt many of you in the process, and I know I already have. But God is gracious. And it says in Psalm 103, it says, The Lord is compassionate and gracious. He is slow to anger, abounding in love. He will not always accuse, nor will he harbor his anger forever. And here's the key. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. You know, I never really felt the weight of that like I did this week. He does not treat us as our sins deserve or repay us according to our iniquities. You know, oftentimes I think we, we picture God's forgiveness in more of an eternal sense that, yeah, He doesn't forgive me for my sins. I don't have to go to hell and be away from Him forever, but He saves us from our troubles now. David wrote about that all the time. Oh, Lord, you've, you've saved this poor man from, from his troubles that are self-inflicted. <laughs> um, and so I am very grateful. That's why I wore the shirt today that I am saved. Not just eternally, but God saved me from making a very, very big and costly mistake with all of you. And it's only the grace of God that, that allows that. And so thank you all for being here, for still coming. <laughs> um, you know, one of the things I've learned through this, God's been a whole lot of stuff this week. <laughs> it's, been an, it's been an eventful week. Um, one of them is is the truth that God's plans do not depend on us. Did you know that? God's plans do not depend on us making the right decisions. Just look at the story of uh, Jacob and Esau, if you know that one. God said before they were born, the older would serve the younger. But yet Jacob achieved that through deceit and treachery and all this stuff. But yet God's plans was that Jacob would be over his brother. And it didn't matter how it came about. Now, Jacob had consequences for how he did that. Just look at David and Bathsheba. Solomon came out of that union, direct line to Jesus himself. And how did David get Bathsheba? Not the right way. God's plans, thank God, do not depend on us, which is why I believe that we are exactly where God wants us to be right now. It's not where we thought it was going to be but it's where he truly wants us to be. In fact, God is not without his sense of humor. Uh, months ago, when I was planning the sermons for, like, when I came back from vacation, I had planned for this Sunday, of course, being in our new location and having raised lots of money and all the things that I said were going to happen, I was going to have a sermon called, Wow, God! Well, it still is. Wow. <laughs> God. But for very different reasons than I uh, anticipated. And again, I am thankful for that. So like I said, we are exactly where God wants us to be, just as it says in Romans 8, 28, that God works all things toward the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose, not to make us happy and you know, all that, but to make us, to form us into the image of his son. That he allowed us, he allowed me to make those mistakes. God wasn't surprised. He didn't fall off his throne. He knew exactly how I would respond. He knew exactly what I would do. He knew exactly how all of you would respond every step of the way. And he allows those things, but then he stops us just short, just like Abraham, when he was told to kill his son, he stopped him just short so that he could learn something. Now, James says, count it joy when you face trials of every kind, right? It produces perseverance, and perseverance, when it's finished its work, makes you mature and complete, lacking nothing. You know, nothing that you go through in life, even the mistakes he allows us to make, teach us something if we'll listen. So, I'm listening. <laughs> um, so, I know we all have a lot of things to learn from this. So, then the next question is, where do we go from here? Where do we go from here? And like I said, I'll open this up to questions, comments, criticisms, anything you like um, after this. Where we go from here, honestly, I don't know, um, like a very specific details. I think this is a great time for us to slow down, to kind of reassess, to huddle up, seek the face of God, um, 
and ask, Lord, what would you have us do? Not, Lord, how can we do that and how can we do that and give us this and give us that, but, Lord, what would you have us do? He's blessed us with a place that we can call our own. In fact, we finally have our own church building. (laughs) Turns out we had it all along, right? Um, To me, this feels like home. And like I said, God, this is where exactly where he wants us. I don't know if we'll be doing this for long. I, I, I don't know. But that's the whole point is that God knows. And if we simply lean and trust on him, he will give, guide us in the right direction. One thing I definitely learned through this process, you know, one of the things as this was going through, and I see this in my journals, is, you know, the push. So I was so certain I heard from God, you know, all of those things I shared with you to me felt like God saying, this is exactly what you're supposed to do. So then when I started having pushback, I was like, so why is, why am I getting pushback? God? And so I went to also look at some leaders in the Bible and as Moses, Moses got pushed back all the time, all the time. I mean, every time he wanted to do something, they pushed back, pushed back. I was like, oh, well, that, there it is. But then this week, once God, you know, unblinded me, uh, he's like, you know, back then I didn't have the Holy Spirit dwelling in everybody. So of course they grumble, they couldn't see it. But now in my church now, it's not Moses on the mountain, everyone get in line, it's unity. We seek the leadership of the Holy Spirit as a group. And so we don't move just because one person has an idea. We slow down. God's never in a hurry. He'll never make you rush to a decision. All these things I already knew once upon a time, but now I'm reminded of. Is that we moved as a we move as a unit. If you read the Acts Church, that's what they did. They always came together. They prayed together. They sought the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And if we are truly all seeking the Holy Spirit, He will give us all the same message. Amen. That's how the Holy Spirit works. Amen. And I lost sight of that. So that's another lesson learned. Um, so yeah, we're going to slow down, do some self-assessing, probably make some changes of different sorts, more than just where we're at and stuff like that. Um, and another thing I think this is a great opportunity to do is really to focus on being the church and not going to church. Because when your church isn't about a place, it's about the people who are part of this local body of Christ. So it's a chance for us to not just get closer in proximity, because we have to, but to get closer as a people. Small groups, all that kind of stuff. In fact, I want, I really, the, the passages that have been going through my mind about this is something we've covered so many times. Acts 2, 42, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe and Many wondrous and miracle signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common, selling their possessions and goods they gave to everyone who had, as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. You know, I've preached that so many times, and I tr- I've, I've even believed it for a long time that it's not us who try to bring who try to grow the church it's the lord grows the church as we do those things as we focus on being the church and i think i lost sight of that i think i was trying to look for a human way to grow the church by getting a new shiny location well, at least for half the church it was but god is good he's gracious he's merciful he does not treat us as our sins deserve. And so, that's pretty much all I got to say. Is that, as far as I know, we'll be doing church here again next Sunday. Um, looks like we have a few church to spare, so that's good. <laughs> if we need to, we can overflow into my office. And I mean, we we'll make it work. You know, back you know, there's churches overseas and places that they all cram standing only into little rooms that don't even have bathrooms and stuff like that. So we are still very blessed to be able to be in air conditioning and all those kinds of things. And so um, it's time for us to be the church and not go to church. Yeah. And so I think that's, that's kind of what God brought us to. That he, He's answering prayer, but he doesn't do it in the way we expect or that we demand that he does. Um, 
So yeah, I guess that's about it. Oh, that's my shortest message ever. <laughs> Rachel's going to be like, you're done already? <laughs> so are they, I guess I'll open it up for questions, comments, criticisms, whatever, whatever you got. You can throw tomatoes if you want. Um, People matter more. That's another one I violated. I even wrote that core value. <laughs> oh, maybe that's where I heard it. Pride. <laughs> I don't know. It's all right. <laughs> Pride is a sneaky one. You can't really see it yourself. But I give you permission. And in fact, I ask each of you, not just my leadership team, but each of you, if you ever see me doing this skit, because guess what? I'm human. I'm going to mess up again. I'm prone. Clearly, God has shown me I am prone to something like this. I can easily hear go, but I can't hear stop. Feel free to remind me of the summer of 17. <laughs> right? just, if you ever see me doing this again, just be like, Daniel, remember the summer of 17. And even if I get mad at you at the time, hopefully I'll go back and let, you know, God will smack me upside the head. So, um, so. anybody else? Questions? Comments? Concerns? So, I have Like I said, it's been kind of an eventful week of God showing me things, especially about myself. You know, it's a beautiful thing when God reveals to you the error of your own ways. Because when he does it, it's never in a condem condemning way. Like he did to me about months ago. I told you about it. He showed me how good of a father he was, but how not so good of a father I was. But it was never condemning. If, 
And that's one way you can know if it's God speaking to you or the enemy. The enemy condemns you. God simply shows you through His grace, like, look what you've done, but I forgive you. I forgive you. I forgave you before you ever did. And what it does is it doesn't highlight how humble or good or anything I am. It highlights how good our God is. He does not treat us as our sins deserve. He does not harbor His anger forever. And He lets us, He lets us mess up. Not that He wills us to, but He lets us mess up, but He's always right there to catch us. You know, when I was talking with Rich, who's also out of town, about this earlier this week, he, out of the blue, kind of, I wasn't even talking, because I hadn't, the whole revealing of my role in this hadn't come up, so we were just kind of talking and he was like, hey, you ever hear that thing about the eagle, you know, in that verse where it says, you know, I'll carry you up on wings like eagles? Um, he said, you know, what eagles do is they carry their young on their back. And what they do is they take them up high and then they drop them to see if they're ready to fly. And if they're not, they go back down and catch them. And that's exactly what God does. He'll, he'll take us up and then he... Not so much dropping us like we're ever gonna like he won't let us fall, but he'll let us fall for a little bit. <laughs> and uh, he's a good, good guy. Very good guy. Anybody else? Katie? I think it's amazing that you can sit up there and say all that they were all coming together. I mean, a lot of people wouldn't do that. They would just keep going slow instead of putting you like with us with everybody. You know, it's interesting, Dan Palmer, you know, at the Kingdom Gospel and all that, he sent me a text a few weeks after the event, and he said that he had had a dream where he saw our church as like this really fit, lean athlete, and that God is pleased with us, that, it, that he's, he's been shaping us and making us stronger as a people, and um, I really see that in you guys. It says a lot about you guys that you wouldn't just fail um, right away. You well, we probably should. <laughs> so thank you guys for being here. You know, I just wanted to say, like, I want to tell you about this, that the church that we were part of before here didn't feel like um, we were really part of the church body. Like, we just didn't, we didn't feel like at all that people, people didn't know us when we were gone. It was just not very the last few weeks from, from um, we kind of had gotten, it was about this amount of people before we left Greenland, and I was kind of worried about, like, who all is going to show up when we go to the campground for a couple weeks, because sometimes people would use it as a place to come from, and, and, uh, and then even today I was interested to see who's all going to show up, but it's just been amazing to see the commitment of the believers in this room to this church body. I just thank you guys for, for coming and, and allowing us to be a part of this because we've been looking for this for a long time. And I just, I've been telling Daniel, it's just like in the Bible we read, you know, they're meeting in, in small places and the upper room is something like that's just been in my mind for a while now. It's not even just like kind of, I don't even know, just that we are the upper room. That we're up here worshiping God, it doesn't matter where we're at. And, um, and I said, you know, I'd volunteer to sit in the window and fall out. So. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but I, I, I just thank you and keep showing up. So um, <clears throat> I'll stop talking in a second and we'll get back up here and do some more worship. I think we got at least three songs to do. I don't know, two. Let's stretch it out a bit. Um, probably, you know how uh, before I left for vacation, I encouraged all of you to read through the Gospels like, as many times as you can. I hope that many of you did that. But um, God's been changing my plans for speaking. I don't think we're going to start the Story Bible, um, but I think what we're going to do is go through the Gospels and we'll see what kind of a man this was. You know, one of the things that really stood out to me as I was reading the Gospels on vacation is that. 
you know, I've heard them many times, but just how people reacted, how they responded to Jesus. They were always amazed. They were always astonished at the, the miracles he did, about the words he said, about how he made Pilate was just amazed at this, at this guy. And um, I think we've lost that amazement because we've heard the story so many times. I think it would be good to kind of go through that. Start looking at those things again, the words he said and the things he did, and just kind of fall in love again with our, with our Lord, <laughs> with Jesus. And um, can't go wrong there. I think that's exactly what it means when it says the apostles' teaching. Because like, what do you think they talked about? <laughs> what, do you think, what do you think they were talking about? Like, Jesus just rose from the dead a little while ago, right? You know, they were probably talking about him a lot. So, anywho, no one wants that scene. I want y'all to join me praying for Dan. Lord Jesus, you set the ultimate example of leadership when you got down on your knees and you humbled yourself and you washed the very steep. Showed no pride. You threw that world's idea of leadership upside down. And I thank you, Father, for the way you have worked in and the way you have been at work all along, even when he couldn't see it, and you opened his eyes. And Father, I thank you that because of that, there is a room full of people here today who have more love more respect and more trust in him as the man you have called to lead reality church. And I thank you, Father, for his humbleness. And I thank you, Father, that you are doing something in reality that no one could have ever imagined. And that the end result is going to be that hard dirt that could not be tilled is going to be tilled. We don't know if, when, or where, and how that's going to look, Father, but we don't need to worry. We don't need to be afraid. We don't need to doubt. We don't need to try to figure out you are going to make it happen. And, Father, we thank you that we have a, we have a man that you have called who's shown us that he is someone we can trust, that he is someone who is seeking to be right with you. And so, Father, I ask you to pour out blessings upon him upon blessings, that you pour out a double mantle of your wisdom and your peace upon him, Father, that he is a, he rises above and beyond anything he ever imagined in what you want to do through him. And, Father, because of the work you are doing in and through Daniel, we praise you for what you are going to do in and for and through reality of the power of the precious and holy name of Jesus. Amen. <coughs> Together, like we did before, and we'll do some worship together. So, yeah, bring chairs back.